Yes, yes, yes. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Hello, Professor Hiranmayi. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Hello. I'm very well. Nice I'm very you. well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Okay. Thank you for having me here. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. We will now continue by welcoming uh, with DAAD, the German Academic Exchange Service. We are pleased to invite Ms. Kanchi Arora and Ms. Uh, and uh, sorry, and architect Ankit Savla for this session. Ms. Kanchi Arora is presently working as an assistant to the director, DAAD South Asia, and is responsible for the region of Karnataka and Kerala since the last two years. She holds a postgraduate degree. Masters of Arts in German Translation and Interpretation in 20, uh, 2018 from the Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, and a Bachelor's in Business Administration from the Maharaja Agrasen Institute of Management Studies, New Delhi, in 2015. Welcome, Ms. Kanchi Arora. Thank you. Uh, briefly, I'd li also like to introduce architect Ankit Savla. Ankit is a practice architect, practicing architect and a computational designer who works as a design partner at Studio ASA in Mumbai. He has been working actively across India and Germany in the domain of architectural design and design strat strategy for the past six years. After working in reputed firms like HCP, Sanjay Puri Architects and volunteering in Ladakh, he moved to Germany in 2013. There, he pursued Master's in Architecture and Performative Design at the Stadel Schule, at the Stadel, Stadel Schule as a DAAD scholar. Most recently, he went back to Berlin in 2019 to complete an executive program in design thinking at Stanford University's sister school, the D School. Ankit loves working in hospitality, institutional, and housing sectors. He has also been a visiting faculty at multiple institutions and has previously been a DAAD Young Ambassador to Germany in India for, uh, for two years. Welcome, Architect Ankit. Thank you, ma'am. I would like to now hand over the session to both of you to take off. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. So I will now quickly share my screen um, before we start the presentation, just a few housekeeping things. Um, first of all, are you able to see my screen? Is this visible? Yes, it is visible. Great. I will turn off my camera for the time that I'm doing the presentation. Uh, would that be all right? Yes, yes, no problem. Great. One second. So, is my screen visible? Is my screen still visible? Yes. Great. So, uh, we would start with, I'll tell you how we go about, first of all, thank you so much, Professor Hiranmay. Thank you so much, Alicia, for having us here. Uh, we are very delighted to, to, uh, to be interacting with the students of RV College of Architecture. Um, so, yeah, and uh, to everyone who is present, in the audience, a big hello from the cold New Delhi. Um, are you still able to see my screen? Because there's something happening. There's something wrong. Yes, yes. Great. So I will tell you how we go about doing the presentation. I will be talking a little bit about the DAD. I'll talk about higher education in, in Germany. Uh, we will then go on to masters. Um, a little bit, a little information about application for masters, a little bit about scholarships, and then we hand it over to Ankit, who would be sharing with you his experiences in Germany and how did he go about doing the courses that he did and what is the way forward after you are done with your masters? Yeah. So, and I would request you, and then we would take questions. And I mean, then we would have a question and answer round. So, I would request you to um, uh, to 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 uh, let us complete the presentation and keep noting down the questions. And then, once we start the question and answer round, we would love to answer the questions for you. 
uh, talking a little bit about the DAAD. Uh, since you're here already, I'm, I mean, I'm sure that you are interested in doing a higher education, in, do, in doing your higher education from Germany. Uh, we will talk about the DAAD, so the German Academic Exchange Service or the Deutscher Akademischer Austauschdienst. Um, it is a, a, it is a self-governing organization. It is funded by different ministries within the German government, and it is also funded by the EU. What we do is we represent the German higher education landscape across the world. So, and the DAD in India then does it for uh, India, of course, and then Nepal, uh, Bhutan, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. Uh, what we do is we promote academic exchange between Germany and the rest of the world. And how we do it is mostly through scholarships. So we are basically a funding organization. We offer scholarships for students to go to Germany, do their higher education and research. And we also fund German students to go to different parts of the world. Um, how we are uh, segregated here in India and across the region of South Asia is that we have uh, an Außensteller or the regional office in New Delhi from where uh, 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 I'm connected to you right now. And then we have different information points in in um, across India, in Pune, B Mumbai, Bangladesh, uh, sorry, uh, Bangalore and Chennai. So then I was th also, also thank you for thank you for the wonderful introduction. I was responsible for uh, Karnataka and Kerala, but then um, I'm also handling stuff at the DAD New Delhi office. So we are, we would have a new person, new contact person for the DAD in Bangalore very soon. So since you are here, I'm already aware that you would be interested in, in, in studying in Germany. But then there are the five main reasons as to why you should consider Germany as your destination for higher education. Uh, the first one being that um, when it comes to how when it comes to the education system in germany it is extremely different from what we have in india there's a lot of um industry university collaboration which means you also have a good theoretical framework and you can also obviously um apply that knowledge in the industry so the industry and the universities they go hand in hand in germany uh, then it is it is excellent for research and it is excellent for training uh, Germany is 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 known for the excellent research facilities that it has. It is known for the for the for the amazing career opportunities after you're done with your with your courses. Then uh, there are also a lot of courses now because Germany and German universities now are opening up to the world. They are coming up with a lot of courses where the medium of instruction is English. Um, uh, where the medium of instruction is English, wherein you really don't have to know German in order to get an admission in any of the university in uh, in the English uh, taught courses. But then we highly, highly recommend that if you are planning to go to Germany, you start learning German uh, because it would be easier for you to navigate. Then Germany, uh, because, the, because the education is state funded, uh, the universities usually do not charge tuition fees. Of course, there are some exceptions to it, but then the, usually the universities do not charge tuition fees also from the international students. Germany is located in the heart of Europe and is, as everyone knows, is also the, um, uh, when it comes across Europe, it is the, it is the, it is in a, in a, in a what do we call it? Um, in, the, in a structure of power that ways it has an upper hand. Uh, I was already talking about how German universities are opening up to international students. We have currently 13.8% international students in Germany and majority of them are of course from China and then India. So the Indian students are the second largest group of international students that we have in Germany. So we'd find a lot of Indians there. Of course, uh, Germany is famous for its research and thus you have a lot of Nobel laureates also from the country. Uh, since you are interested in, in masters in your higher education in Germany, it is extremely, extremely important for you to know uh, the university landscape in Germany. So um, 
the german universities there are more than 400 plus institutions of universities universities of applied sciences research institutions etc uh the diversity when it comes to institutions as well as the courses is is i mean you you, you the courses are quite diverse and they follow uh, the humboldtian philosophy wherein they strictly believe in the freedom of research so if you are interested in research uh it is meant to be done independently and not you would not face a lot of interventions per se so there are two types of universities in germany there are universities of actually there are three so there are universities and then there are universities of applied sciences and then there are colleges of music art and film so since we are talking about masters in germany it is it is extremely important for you to know uh, what is the difference between the universities or also the technical universities and the universities of applied sciences so the universities which in german are called as universitaten or the technical universities uh for example you would have heard about let's say technical university of berlin technical university of munchen dresden etc etc um so these universities are traditional universities and are more oriented towards research right whereas when we talk about universities of applied sciences which are also called the fachhochschule in german uh they are Uh, they are industry oriented so this is the main difference between universities or technical universities and universities of applied sciences the universities uh they focus more on the fundamental knowledge on research and the university of applied sciences they are oriented towards the industry so the kind of people you would find so the exposure at both the places are ex is extremely different uh the professors you'd find professors researchers senior researchers scientists at the university whereas at the university of applied sciences you, <coughs> sorry you would find people who have been in the industry for a very very long time are also conducting research so if you are let's say interested of course whatever i'm saying has exceptions but if you are interested after your masters let's say if you want to take a phd if you want to go into academia if you want to start research a university is a better place for you and if you are interested with the industry side of it then the university of applied sciences or the fachhochschule they are better for you so in any case whenever it is that you are stuck with the decision making we would uh we would uh, recommend that you look up the course content see what interests you the more see what aligns with the with the future plans that you have and then take a decision if you want to study at a university or a university of applied sciences now please do not think of it like uh what we have in india wherein you have hierarchy within the uh, institutions this is not the same case in in germany in germany you have different different approach would have different uh, schools and that is how uh, and that does you should be aware of uh, where you would want to get the admission so talking a little bit about the eligibility for masters in germany usually a four years bachelor's degree from india from indian universities from a recognized indian university is not a problem if in case which should not be the case uh, for architecture students but in case you have a three year bachelor degree uh, you could always write to the university saying this is the problem and they would they will tell you a way uh, around it Uh, because the universities in germany are autonomous and are free to make their own decisions so what you require for masters in germany is uh, you would require your uh, transcripts you would require the university application form if you are interested in applying to a to the university to a course which is english taught then you would need your ielts or toefl score the university will mention the what kind of scores do you need what band do you need you would definitely need a letter of motivation stating why it is that you want to do this course at this, at this university so exactly a statement of purpose as we call it and then you might or might not read uh, need the letters of recommendation from your professors this is again very individual to different universities since the universities in germany are autonomous yeah so that and what is, another thing which i think is missing here is the cv you would need your cv in uh, tabular european format as we call it so cv your transcripts 
and your uh, letter of motivation are the three things that every university would ask you. Uh, and then, of course, if you're going for an English taught course, you will have to uh, submit the TOEFL or IELTS score. There is also a possibility that since you are from India and your working language has always been English, you could always tell them that, you know, uh, I've all my life I've taken classes in English, everything, and you might also be exempted from taking the IELTS or TOEFL. That is also the case. Now, I was talking about Germany opening up to the international students and how they're coming up with new international programs uh, where the medium of instruction is English. So now there are a lot of programs, especially at the master's level, where you do not need to know German at all to get an, to get an admission, uh, to get an acceptance from a German university. Uh, but but it is highly, highly recommended. I'm sure Ankit would also uh, agree to this, that if you are interested in going to Germany, it is extremely important that you start learning the language because it's essentially a German speaking country. All the people now know German, they uh, know English there. I mean, especially the young people, they already speak English, but then it is always beneficial to navigate your way through the country. Yeah. Now, where would you, all this is all right, I mean, you know now what are the kinds of institutions you have. You have universities, universities of applied sciences. This is what you need for masters. But where exactly would you look for courses? So the two links that you see on your screens are basically the course databases. So the one the one with international programs is dad.de slash international hyphen programs. This is a database of all the courses offered by German universities where the medium of instruction is English. And the, the other database is study-in-germany.de. This is, let's say, a more comprehensive database wherein uh, you would find courses not just in English, also in German, French, Danish, etc., etc. So these are the two databases, extremely important for you to know to look for courses. You could shortlist the courses here. If you go on, let's say, study-in-germany.de, all you have to do is put in the keyword. Let's say you put in architecture. You, um, you, you, you click on English taught programs. You click on university, university of applied sciences, whatever. You can also sort it on the basis of, on the basis of region, uh, cities, and things like that. And if you once you click on search, you will get a list of universities uh, according to the filters that you have put. So you already have shortlisted. You have a few universities, and you can then look at the course content and see what interests you. And you could shortlist those universities, and you could start applying. Now, um, the study in Germany uh, database would also give you the application deadline, the the requirements that you uh, the requirements for the particular university, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these are also mentioned on the study in Germany database. But it is always highly recommended that you visit the university's website also to get more updated information, especially in the times of Corona. Now, this is what your application schedule looks like. So Germany's, Germany has two semesters, the German universities. There's winter semester, there's summer semester. Winter semester starts in October. Summer semester starts in April. And for winter semester, which starts in October, um, let's say for October 2021, this year, the applications would start somewhere around March and would go on until June, July. That is the usual application window. It would start somewhere around March, go on until June, July. But there are, of course, some universities that have already started the application. So let's say the RWTH, RWTH Aachen, or TUM, they already start their application in December or January. So, And that is why you need to be extremely vigilant uh, when you are applying for the universities, <clears throat> because every university might have different deadlines. So this is how the schedule looks like. You start gathering information. You should have started that by now if you want to go into 2021. And then you do with the application procedure, follow exactly what's written on their website. And once you're through with that, you start looking for the accommodation a bit. You then apply for a visa. For Bangalore, please make sure that you apply for a visa well in advance because the consulate in Bangalore is uh, usually uh, gets a lot of applications and it gets difficult to get visa appointments. 
and then october i think by september end you should be reaching the university or the university town so this is exactly how how the winter semester schedule would look like for you now coming to application for the universities right so the university website would always tell you how to apply there are two ways to go about the application you could either apply directly to the university's website or the universities might ask you to apply through a portal called uni assist now the uni assist what is uni assist it is a paid application portal it does the first screening of the application for you okay which means that if the university asks you to to um, apply through uni assist and not directly on their portal you will have to send one set of hard copies one set of soft copies to uni assist so make sure that you do the application well in time because uni assist would at least need 4 weeks to do the to do the screening of your application and then get back to you with the application uh, with the evaluation report of the application and then if there's anything missing you could always send them back but that has to be done well in advance so that you don't hit the deadline so uh, and uni assist like i said is a paid application portal so for the first application in in the winter semester for the first application it would charge you 75 euros for the additional applications it would keep charging you 30 euros subsequently yeah uh, and let's say you're applying to five different universities one set of documents is enough with five letters of motivation stating uh, why you'd want to do the course at that university please make sure that you do not get in touch with education consultants when it comes to germany because uh german universities they do not operate through consultants and it would lower your chances of getting into 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 a good university and always always follow whatever is written on the university's website because the websites are updated talking a little bit about tuition fees uh the usual usually there's no tuition fee fees with the state of baden wittenberg and the universities in the state of baden wittenberg now have started charging tuition fees um what you are required to pay however is a semester contribution which could go up to up till 400 euros so from 200 to 400 euros which is like an administrative cost this allow i mean you get a lot of benefits when you are a student in 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 germany and then again i think uh, while you'll be listening ankit he would mention this but then when you are student in germany uh, and you are you are required to pay the semester contribution what you get is a semester ticket which allows you to travel in and around that state using public transport for free and it allows you it it, it also gives you a lot of discounts a lot of student discounts uh, on cultural events theaters and things like that yeah so it's really really um it's a bliss to be a student in 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 germany like i said for the english language proficiency uh, the universities might ask you for toefl or nils these are the bands again they would specify the band sometimes they might ask for a 7.5 also let's say when it comes to i ielts uh if you are interested in, in doing a course in german these are the widely accepted tests for german language proficiency uh the goethe institute the dsh and the test daf uh when it comes to uni assist or when uh when when we say that you have to get your certificates attested the te- the authorities that are allowed to attest your certificates are uh is the issuing institution as in your university or the notary or the german embassy or the consulate so you could always take an appointment at the german consulate and uh usually for the first three documents for the first three sets they would do it for they wouldn't charge you for any kind of attestations and you wouldn't need more than that this these are how the living expenses look like uh 865 euros per month is the revised amount now so 865 euros is what you would need uh it could of, of course it's an average so it could go up to let's say 950 euros per month if you are in an expensive city let's say munich or if it could also go down to to 750 euros if you are in a smaller town 
it again depends on where you are in Germany. It depends on your lifestyle. But then 865 euros is a funny average number that we have. You are allowed to work part time, 120 full days or 240 half days in a year. Uh, you could be working on the campus. You could be working outside the campus. If you're working on the campus, let's say as a research assistant or something, you could always get it extended. You will have to get in touch with the with the authorities, with the aliens registration in office, and then you can get it extended. But then usually it is 120 full days or 240 half days for a year. Once you are done with your course in Germany, there are a lot to there's a lot to look forward to. You could start your own uh, thing. You could start. Uh, you could have a business there. You could take up employment. You could start a PhD. You could, because since your degree would be from Germany, you could also be working in another country in the European Union. But <clears throat> the good thing about Germany is that once you are through with your course, you get 18 months. 18 months to to um to get to find a job so you could be working wherever doing whatever but once you are done with your course you get 18 months to find a job related to whatever it is that you have studied and then your stay in germany depends on your employment contract a lot of students have had the have had this question in the past uh about the university ranking. So the universities do not follow the QS ranking. In the German universities do not follow QS, QS ranking or things like that because the universities are state funded. So the education, uh, the standard of education across Germany is the same. Uh, but if you still are persistent on checking the ranking, there are different criteria. The universities are ranked, let's say, uh what kind of research facilities the university has how many faculties international students things like that and that you could check on this web on this link on the chhe ranking page so this is how a bit of i mean these are the glimpses of how the universities are so this is the can this is the canteen the mensa this is the laboratory this is how the bibliotheque which means the library looks like now, since I've been screaming that DAAD is a scholarship organization, it's a funding organization, let us also talk a little bit about scholarships. Uh, so for bachelors, we do not have a lot of scholarships. Also, it might not be relevant. For masters, we do have two very relevant scholarships for you, uh, one in architecture and one in uh, development-related postgraduate courses. What we have, uh, DAD has the flagship program. Uh, we offer scholarships for PhD, basically, wherein you get a full grant for uh, for pursuing your PhD from uh, from Germany. You could also be a student here, and then uh, if you want to go for research, you could also get in touch with the DAD for the scholarship part. But today, let us talk about the scholarship for masters in architecture and epos and to know where you would find all these all the programs all these programs the architecture one and the development related these are to be found on these two websites again dad.de and funding-guide.de these are scholarship databases this these would have scholarships the funding-guide.de has scholarships not just by the dad but also by other organizations Talking a little bit about the development related postgraduate courses again, uh, this had, I mean, these are, you could be doing uh, your master's degree uh, in Germany. But what you need is two years of relevant work experience. Once you are, uh, if you want to apply for the EPOS scholarship, so EPOS has a uh, courses related to urban planning, sustainable development, uh, uh, and like, um, so not exactly architecture, but more or less related. So you could always just check out the EPOS brochure on funding-guide.de, see if you fulfill the requirements, and then you could just apply directly to the, DA, to the university with the DAD green form. What you get is 861 euros if you are a bachelor, if you have a bachelor's degree and 1200 euros per month if you have 
a PhD degree, PhD degree, and would want to go for masters. What you require is two years of work experience in the related field. Now, talking about the postgraduate, uh, the the scholarship postgraduate studies in the field of architecture. Uh, bachelor's and master's students can apply. They can apply for course in architecture, master's course in architecture, and you could apply with the green DAD form. What you get is 861 euros per month, plus a bit of additional employ uh, allowances. Please remember that DAD does not uh, cover scholarships, uh, is on only covers mobility scholarships. So for research, for equipments and things like that, that is not something that the DAD covers. The DAD would cover your flight costs, your accommodation, and your your health insurance and things like that. Talking a little bit about visa, so for you the uh, relevant consulate would be the consulate in Bangalore. Uh, please make sure that you uh, approach the consulate or the VFS well in advance. What you would need is your visa um, application document along with your passport size photographs, your certificates and what you would also need is your blogged account. Now, what is a blogged account? A blogged account would be if, let's say, you are not, if you are not uh, funded by the DAD or by any other organization, uh, the universe, the visa uh, officials would need to know how do you plan to sustain in Germany. So that is why what you would need is 10,380 euros for a year. That would be blogged in an account. Uh, you could get it done through Kotak Bank, through Deutsche Bank, and there are a lot of other banks, um, Fintiba, etc. The list of the the list of the um, banks is also there on the website, along with the checklist of all the documents that you need for the visa. You will get it here on www.india.diplo.de. This has the checklist of all the visa documents that you need, and so 10,380 euros per year is what you would need for your visa. And you'd only be allowed to withdraw a certain amount. Uh, and you would only be allowed to withdraw this certain amount in Germany. So this uh, guarantees your, uh, this guarantees how you would sustain yourself in Germany. <coughs> Sorry. So, and then here are some important links. So for the study in Germany website, uh, you have study-in.de or study-in-germany.de for the course database. If you want to look at different universities, you have another website, Hochschule Kompass. The international offices, every university in Germany has, it has an international office. You could always get in touch with the international office. The scholarship database is funding-guide.de. And for international programs, you have the link here. If you want to know what the DAD is up to in your region, you could always just scan the QR code and subscribe to the newsletter. The newsletter has information like when are we doing a pre-departure for the students in Germ uh, who are going to Germany or what are the new doctoral positions coming up? What are the new um, scholarships that are there? What are the new scholarship holders? Who are the new scholarship holders? the testimonials and things like that. So if you want to uh, be updated with the DAD, you could always just sign, uh, subscribe to the newsletter here. And for any information related to study and research in Germany, you could always get in touch with me or we, when we would have a new person, you could always get in touch with the new person. The email ID remains the same, bangalore at daadindia.org. And I'd now like to hand it over to uh, Ankit. Thank you, Kanchi. Mm. You're most oh, welcome. Just one second. I'll stop sharing sure. my screen here. And yeah, Ankit. So over to you. Okay. And we could then take up questions later. Sure. Um, is my screen visible? Yes, and, yes, um, it is visible. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to, of course, um, start with a short thank you note for the RB College of Architecture for inviting me. And of course, the DAD for once again inviting me to share my experiences of Germany. 
um, I write uh, normally um, as the German. I write my presentation as a German story is because um, usually it's not 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 a well sorted presentation like the one the DAD normally gives, which Kanchi teachers they gave. Um, it's more of my experiences. Um, of course, uh, being a designer, being an architect, uh, more closer to probably uh, what I understand um, it is to make this whole process uh, into a reality of the decision of you know choosing and uh, moving abroad. So um, I start this presentation with a picture from Germany. And um, of course, as soon as you think of Europe or you think of uh, Germany, the first thing uh, that most of us think of is um, the experience of the snow and you know, the experience of, of the lifestyle there. And, and that's actually something I want to start the presentation with. Um, um, you know, um, experience anywhere abroad, not just Germany, uh, is not just about education. It's not just going to be about uh, what you will learn there, what university you go to. But I think a huge chunk if not uh, if not a 50 50 but a huge chunk of your learnings would come out of life skills uh, would come out of experiences that you will learn uh, while from the process of selecting starting to uh, you know figure out what you want to do your masters in what you want to uh, which university do you want to go to etc and the whole experiencing experience from there all the way up to when you probably get a job and you feel very settled in Germany. And that is something which all of you uh, really need to be interested in because uh, if you just look at it as a degree and not, not just Germany, but this is in general, if you just look at it as a degree, it's only half job done. And uh, that is something uh, which you should really keep in mind. Um, I have sort of divided my presentation into four parts and that's how usually my journey has kind of been. Uh, architecture 1.0 is what I talk about my grad, uh, my undergrad life in Mumbai. That was my bachelor's in architecture, which all of you are pursuing right now. Um, my jobs in India and the whole transition of Germany. Um, then I talk a little bit about my experience in Germany and I talk a little bit about what I do here and how I keep in touch with Germany today. So um, this again is a snippet from my portfolio. Um, it's the second year project, something you guys would be very familiar to when I start uh, to show this also because uh, I want you to also see the, the changes uh, that kind of happened in my work uh, with the whole German experience. So this is one of the projects that I did. And uh, um, I was, I mean, of course, very happy by the end of the fifth year to be able to uh, have a good portfolio, to be able to apply to universities abroad uh, and get admission in most of the universities that I applied to. Um, it's also very important to understand that, uh, like Kanchi also mentioned about the, the list of things uh, that need to be sent for the application. One of the most important documents for us as architects or designers is going to be a portfolio. And uh, that, of course, in correlation with all the other documents that need to be sent uh, is extremely important. Uh, and, you know, and, al and also the DAD for the scholarship requires a portfolio, which gets judged by different architects and designers. So extremely important as uh, a document. Um, so after bachelor's, uh, of course, I worked in Ahmedabad uh, at the at CP, did, did some work with them. And uh, I'm also trying to uh, say my story is so that you get to know what are the experiences I collected from India before I applied for the scholarship. And I believe that uh, those experiences also helped me get the scholarship as well as my admission in uh, Germany. Uh, so this was a project that uh, I was working on in Ladakh for a relief shelter home uh, at the NGO supporting uh, some Ladakhi flood victims whose uh, house got destroyed. Um, I worked for Sanjay Puri, standard uh, design competitions, large township projects. Um, this was a clubhouse that we designed for them. Uh, of course, I'm not going to get into details of the projects, but just taking you through the experiences again. Um, hardcore projects happening in Mumbai, tall, um, tall skyscrapers where, you know, facades are very important. Uh, planning of the houses is just by regulations. Uh, architecture is taught uh, and um, also practiced in a very, um, very practical manner where you have to encompass all the laws, regulations, etc. And of course, I loved all of this and all these experiences 
till today uh, have been extremely important for me um, architecture 2.0 is the part where i moved to germany and uh, something which all of you will experience and wherever you go is that there would be a certain amount of unlearning that will happen when you enter germany and when you enter any new institution abroad um, that's mainly because uh, in india we of course uh, not all schools but a, a large amount uh, a large number of schools including mine in mumbai uh, were a little focused on how architectures build how the building is built how landscapes get built how interior design is done materials etc uh where in the school that i went to and uh, the school um, according to me and of course according to uh, certain publications is one of the finest architecture schools that exist on the planet it's called the stadel schule architecture class and back then it was being led by professor johan betum who is a leading professor in europe and one of the most uh, popular architects uh, in the world ben van berkel um so Uh, from a setup where um, i was building buildings uh, to the whole idea of transitioning into a new country and settling into a course uh, which in india is more popular as parametric design or digital architecture but of course it spells out much more uh, when you go there and uh, what what we did there was basically uh, rethinking the way architecture design etc is uh, looked at now um, beautiful pictures that kanchi showed uh, these are the real pictures from i mean taken from the internet but pictures from my school uh, the library of course was much much smaller uh, also the school that i went to was a very small school we were only 300 people it was a school of fine arts which ran an architecture program so it was very close to art uh, very close to sculpture very close to a lot of different uh, interdisciplinary uh, you know uh, fields uh, around what we did we had beautiful attic uh, studios um, summers in the attic studios would be amazing uh, winters would of course really be bad um, there is uh, on the on the right bottom you see an outdoor space where you know uh, there's transition between winter summers very beautiful spaces the the glass building that you see is our mensa to the to the left bottom you see the mensa from the interior side um, also the mensa was designed by sir peter cook who's one of the most popular european architects and has done very few projects and we were sort of blessed to uh, you know be sitting under a roof uh, done by him um, the bibliotheca of course uh, was kind of small uh, but um, has one of the largest collections of uh, amazing architecture books design books um a class typical class uh, for for a visiting faculty coming uh, would look like this uh, we were of course uh, uh, so in this picture you practically see around 20 countries being represented to the forefront you see uh, two professors to the right the the man is mark weekly who used to be at the dean at university of columbia in the united states and the architecture department and on the left is beatrice colomina uh, who uh, is one of the most um, prolific academicians in the united states and leads a program or used to lead a program at the princeton university um two days with guys like this uh, they would just fly in from the us to germany um and our lectures would start from saturday morning with a lot of coffee uh, and would go on till sunday evening and um, having them for one more day would be like volcanoes for us so they came in with so much of architectural uh research architectural discourse uh, for us that uh, we couldn't even tolerate them for more than two days like they were so good at what they did and uh, we would have them for a couple of days every year and they would typically be the professors teaching us architectural theory they did not do studios for us uh, studios of course was very much ongoing um, the the person you see a uh, very um, predominantly sitting in the white shirt behind is our program director johan betten uh, A, a very organic person practically lived in the university that where where i studied uh, the setup here is done uh, by um, um is is a studio project done by the, the seniors that we had back then and uh, um our professors and our uh, faculty the students the, the different batches which kind of uh, worked together always had these very interesting debates discussions uh, critics on works 
So a lot of these setups would be there. This is not a permanent setup. It's a temporary setup, but we had a lot of such activities happening where uh, setups would be there and, and very casual discussions. And these discussions would end up going into uh, six, eight hours, 10 hours of just discussions. Models would be kept there and people would just talk about it. Um, sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, on the front, uh, on the right, you see uh, Professor Ben Van Berkel. Uh, typically, um, we didn't have grading system per se. Of course, that we were being graded, and that's what we got to know at the end of the second year. But that's mainly because of the rules and regulations in Germany. Otherwise, uh, our grading would typically be uh, men like these and women like these uh, coming and uh, just giving you critics on your work and uh, Typically, our studio presentations would be walls full of drawings, uh, drawings much different than what we do here. A uh, lot of models, a lot of study models, a lot of uh, articulated presentations. Um, and of course, the whole class was allowed to speak when uh, this presentation was being done. So it was never that um, there was a hierarchy of any sort. Um, so you see right now a person who runs um, um, a studio which has, I think, around 300 or more people and a couple of offices across the globe um, could be considered in the top 10 or 20 in the world to very hardcore academic people who probably have not uh, constructed buildings to younger generation uh, researchers and academicians. So uh, what you got from these professors was uh, very intense criticism, uh, very intense uh, you know, ideas of how you can work ahead in your projects. Um, I'll just um, um, hit the face of my colleague because I did not have permission from him to show his uh, face, but uh, models typically would look like these, and these are only study models. And in a way, study models and, and final models don't really have so much of a difference back there. Um, for all you know, the study model would become the final model at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the studio project. But uh, typically, a lot of intense work went into each of these pieces, and we would experiment with different technology. The small piece in red is a 3D printed model, for example. So there was a lot of uh, different uh, ways in which you had to present your work, uh, articulate your work. Um, this uh, is a snippet of what I did for my uh, master's uh, thesis and uh, something which I wanted to, when I started the presentation, I showed you a project uh, from my bachelor's. And uh, this is a completely different way of thinking of thinking on concepts for design. So starting to think on how design and architecture would, would start uh, working in, sorry. So, yeah. Um, so this, of course, is again a picture of my final thesis model. And as I told you, uh, thesis models are not typically those large models that we make with a lot of landscape design, building design, etc. But it could be as simple as these. Uh, of course, it, it's simple looking, uh, but it, it's a lot of uh, blood and sweat gone into making these. Um, it, of course, shows certain steps of my design process. But uh, what's also important to understand is that... Uh, in most schools abroad, uh, including Germany, uh, the process is going to be extremely important. Uh, and towards the or till the end of the the studio projects or till the end of your thesis, uh, the process is going to always be in, is always given like the real value. An interior uh, picture of my thesis, um, absolutely a different way of thinking um, or imagining architecture. And um, something which if I showed today while applying to even Sanjay Puri where I've worked before uh, would be a question um, whether this is doable, workable, etc. But um, when you go there and when you actually start thinking on how you are making these designs happen, um, how the material technology can be done and how an architect can play a role in designing new materials, designing new technology to execute new projects, um, it, it really is an enriching experience. Um, every year, uh, most art and architecture schools um, have large exhibitions. This is, and these exhibitions are not just in the university. So they are spread all over the city. This is a satellite location where the model on the front is, is what my group had presented. Uh, it's also um, a very interesting 
film director's house where we are presenting this and uh, typically it was a walking presentation that happened all over sorry um these are again images from the internet uh, i don't take credits for the photos but uh, what i also wanted to mention very strongly is that i went to a school which was uh, sort of not in one of the divisions where uh, you saw in the previous presentation by kanchi where they had pakok shula university the university would focus more on research pakok shula would be applied sciences so more practical uh, i went to an art school so my school was known as taklisha hokushul if you build in kunst and build in kunst is fine arts so uh, the larger pedagogy pedagogy of uh, what we did uh, of course um, had very close interjections uh, and of course interjections would be more visual not really sharing studio spaces in a way but uh, sort of uh, seeing work uh, for many days uh, you know making friends with artists uh, very important artists um, of germany and uh, getting to know them how they work what they do what what is it that they show in their work right now so very close interjections with them but of course this is not the work from the architecture class i think the top left is but the other two are not this is from the art school but we were in the same campus and very close um, this again is an image uh, of an installation that we made for one of the largest uh, largest um, light exhibitions that happen in the world um, it's called the luminala and we again um, found a, a satellite location and it was like a public uh, installation being installed there for 7 days so again a completely new experience of presenting architecture to the people uh, looking at buildings in a very different way looking at interaction of buildings with human beings in a very different way and a very different scale uh, this of course was done in collaboration with a university in australia and uh, all all the uh, and someone in china who was doing a lot of fabrication for us of course uh, it was not just about studies academics it it kind of looks intense with what i presented but we had a lot of parties a lot of parties um, this again is around 2022 countries sitting in one picture um, um, amazing people uh, come with a lot of different talent some were very immediate uh, graduates uh, some people are not here have a family with two uh, children at home and hence they did not make it to parties for example but uh, a lot of different people across the world so it's so much of rich knowledge that you even get from your colleagues uh, also something important to know is that only one person in this whole picture and in my class was german so uh, one thing you also need to keep in mind is that uh, you will meet a lot of people across the world and if you are not going to learn from them or learn from what they learned before or at their offices etc it's almost again going to be uh, half done the job is half done and um, apart from that of course i had a life outside my art school it's very hard to say that you have an um, um life outside your architecture class and and colleagues there um uh, these um i was very lucky and honored to be a dad scholarship holder for my masters program the one which men was mentioned in the previous presentation i held it for three semesters and uh, i was uh, really uh, i it really got a lot of chance to meet a lot of people from different industries different fields uh, to the to the left for example is frankfurt in 2014 which was an uh, scholarship holders meet uh, at one of the pubs in frankfurt uh, to the right is where all the indian delegates uh, who got the scholarship not all but i think few of them uh, who got a scholarship that year uh, were Uh, meeting during a DAD meet, and to the left is more recent when I was again in Germany, and uh, I was lucky enough to participate in a DAD alumni meet. So these are uh, scholars who are currently more or less settled in Germany. Um, they have already received the the, the scholarship, or some of them have the scholarship right now. Uh, but these are people who kind of become your extended family, your extended network of people in India and abroad. uh design 3.0 um has was was more of an experience where um, um okay i'm, I'm going to probably go faster now 
because this is a different course that I did in 2016 and 19. It's called design thinking. If uh, somebody comes across this word and wants to know more about it and wants to know how an architect experienced design thinking, uh, which seems sounds like a misnomer to us, but uh, it's, it's a very interesting program uh, and a very reputed university. Uh, university of Potsdam has the school. Um, we can also get in touch. Uh, it's more to do with uh, business strategy, design strategy, but all of us are also eligible to do a program like this. Um, design X.0 is what I currently do. So I have my feet in different places. I am a partner at a, at a studio which uh, does a lot of interior and architecture projects. This is one of my designs, uh, which I completed uh, a year before the lockdown. And uh, it's it used to sit in Mumbai. I think now it shut it down because of the lockdown. Um, I'm also involved because of the second program that I did. I am lucky enough to collaborate with product designers, industrial designers, design strategists, uh, mechanical engineers to come up with new designs for uh, stationary products. Um, I also work in the domain of design strategy where I help uh, companies come up with new ideas for launching products. And that all is extremely uh, close to us is because of our experience of being with the user all the time and you know, knowing user needs, etc. Um, I'm also training as a corporate trainer at universities. I've uh, briefly taught at IIM Indore, IIM Ghaziabad. Um, I was uh, lucky enough to uh, be a visiting faculty at around six universities so far. Um, and of course, coming back to India has not just been about work and uh, all of that. It's also been about uh, meeting new people, um, being in a different position. So I used to like the picture that you see below is, is a design school in India, in Bombay. And a um, couple of years before this, I used to be where the students are sitting. But uh, I was honored to be a part of a roundtable conference. Uh, There's also a school at, that I taught in where we were read looking at how design education should be taught in India and to Indian students who now are almost like global participants to the design uh, fraternity. Uh, above you see pictures where I sort of presented, uh, I represented uh, with, of course, my colleagues, uh, I, I think around 26, 30 of us represent uh, Germany, German education in India through a program called the Young Ambassador Program, uh, which I was a part of for two years. But of course, um, I, I still uh, sort of regularly keep in touch with the DAD for different events. Uh, what's also interesting, Mumbai 2020, before the lockdown or maybe late 2019, uh, what's interesting is a session like this in 2011, when I had started to think and when I was in your position, was a small room uh, which only had 12 participants or 11 participants. Uh, and that would be a couple of events a year, maybe three or four, I'm not even sure. Um, and today, a DAD info session, which is not to do just about DAD, but it's it's about higher education in Germany, like we are talking today, uh, is typically like this in Mumbai. Um, and it's not just one such session, there are at least four or five such sessions. So the number of people looking at Germany uh, for the higher education, for research, for PhDs, really increasing and getting a lot more competitive. But at the same time, there are a lot more universities, a lot more uh, universities offering courses in English and a lot of more different. So my life uh, and my professional life and my, my journey in architecture and design has been like a roller coaster. Uh, ups and downs, of course, um, talked more about the, the nicer memories in Germany. Um, and after coming back, but of course, it's, it always comes with a lot of downers uh, and a lot of new experiences that keep you going. Um, if you have more questions regarding portfolio, CVs, um, what universities, how do I select my course? Very important is to understand the school of thought of the university that you go to. Um, um, if you don't understand what do, you, what do I mean by school of thought, and if you think that that's something interesting that you should know about, please write to me. Uh, that's my email ID. And of course, I give my image credits to different universities and organizations that I've worked with. Um, that more or less ends my presentation. I think Kanji should be start taking yeah, questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Ankit. This is amazing. Thank you. It was an excellent presentation. 
if you have questions for us, please feel free to uh, type your questions in the chat box here, and we'd love to take questions. I think we already have one, Ankit. It is Samruddhi asks, is it recommended? Uh, Alisha, would you like to moderate? Would you Would you want to moderate? So it's OK. You can read it. All then right. I have some more with me. OK, all right. Uh, thank you. Uh, so Samruddhi asks, is it recommended? I think, uh, Ankit, you should be taking this. Is it recommended to work for a couple of years after graduation? Or can we apply immediately after the degree? OK, um, so I have uh, different notions. Uh, before I left, of course, I was like you, um, wanting to take the experience so that you know my job is sorted when I move to Germany, etc. Um, you know, I know things, but um, it's important to understand or you know, it's important to know what you're, you're taking the experience in. So if you uh, plan to go for parametric design that I went for, and you work for somebody um, who doesn't have relevant experience in that maybe that experience is not uh, going to be very helpful so of course if you're very sure of what you choose uh, and you already know by the fifth year that you graduate that this is what i want to do it is fine to move abroad but um, of course in architecture in general it's always good to have experience before you leave for germany but at the same time if you can save those two years here and maybe go abroad and take that experience in terms of internships, in terms of uh, practicums, etc., that would probably benefit you more. So, but of course, if you're in a, in a position where you're not sure of what is your master's or what are you going to specialize in, then you should definitely give some time between your two degrees. Thank you. Thank you, Ankit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a, a few more questions. It's mute. No, no, uh, no. You're there is one on order. the um, chat box now. So, oh, is it? Yeah. yeah, there's a new question. Okay. Are there a lot of job opportunities after doing masters in Germany? Kachi, do you want to take that or should I? Yeah. <laughs> Okay. I could. I mean, uh, for architecture, I think you should be able to uh, tell better than sure. I would. But then. In general, also for for uh, after you're done with your graduation, your post graduation in Germany, uh, Germany offers you excellent job opportunities. But I think, and uh, Ankit, correct me if I'm wrong here. Uh, I think it is always always uh, recommended that you know the language a bit to be able to access those resources. So in terms of in terms of uh, applications, if you want to apply for a job, uh, what do we call it, a job position, uh, you, it is usually they might ask you for, let's say, and also because it's architecture, so you would have to, in any case, be dealing with the client, which who might or might not be, uh, I mean, Germans, but then or German speaking for that matter. Uh, so that is why, yes, there are opportunities, but you would be restricting your opportunities if you do not know the language. And if you have any specific detail to that, uh, Ankit, I would request you to add that here. Sure. Um, so, um, OK, um, coming from, again, the perspective back in 2011. Um, so this was closer to the recession, the big the recession, which happened in the United States, um, UK, primarily Germany in that way, kind of withheld its position as an economic country in Europe. Uh, I come from that time. And I also understand your position where you talk about jobs before, because we spend a lot of money and the conversion is quite a lot. Um, so if somebody is, uh, so one thing you need to know is today and by the time you actually apply and graduate, the economic scenario is going to be extremely different. So anything I tell today or Kanji tells today might be absolutely irrelevant in the cu next couple of years. As on today, uh, when I, I mean, as on today and 2015, when I graduated, uh, what I can tell you is uh, that we were, I think around seven or eight Indian students in my university. And I'm the only one who wanted to come back. And hence, I came back. So all of them are placed. Uh, and again, it is what you want to do, as Kanchi said, uh, if you want to work for uh, for big organizations, uh, it's always good to have German language as, as like your uh, SWAD. But it will always be the, your academic uh, portfolio. Your work is always going to be very important. Uh, to work for more local architects in Germany, of course, the, the primary uh, concern is going to be the language because they're operating uh, in organization. And of course, you know, uh, our, our offices are very tiny. So the largest office, there would be 300, but typically it would be seven, eight, 15 people. So you being an 
outsider in some way uh, would not uh, they would not be comfortable with you uh, or you know re explaining everything in english uh, one more important thing is that if you already know a little bit of basic german uh, architecture german uh, or the technical german is again very different and a lot of drawings that you get uh, which need to be read or emails that need to be replied uh, often come in german so if you want to climb the ladder in that office or in different organizations going to be very important to know german but generally yes there are lots of job opportunities uh, it takes a little bit of time which is why the german government gives you an 18 month arbeitssuchen visa which is a work a visa uh, with with a full time working opportunity also within those 18 months so it's not like the united states Uh, to my best knowledge they don't let you do other jobs but during these 18 months to survive in germany you can also do odd jobs uh, and you can also work as an intern and after that once you have a proper job you move on to a different grade of a visa but um, right now as of today settling in germany if somebody really wants to settle in germany is is really really possible and i know a lot of people who have very uh, smoothly found permanent residences and very good jobs including blue cards in germany okay uh, thank you uh, we have a set of questions uh, here in the chat box uh, basically the first three questions are related to the language issue itself Perfect. like how, how difficult is it to cope with german taught courses is it recommended to go for a german taught course and how easy or difficult it is to cope up with the language in germany Uh, ankit would you like me to take that one yeah sure <laughs> all right so like just imagine yourself like for example i was in bangalore and i didn't know kannada right and i am now in a class where where it's being taught where kannada is the language that is being used to teach you uh, things so just in from that perspective uh, think about it that german would be a foreign language to reach to reach uh, i mean to learn the language and to reach a level where you could understand it um understand it in terms of whatever is going on around the daily life and things like that that is still possible but then you will have to definitely put in extra effort to like uh, ankit said do the 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 subject specific vocabulary that you need so if you want to take a take up a course in german it is you could i mean i mean i would not discourage you from doing that but then think about that you'll have to learn german which is all right daily language is also all right so you could do let's say a b1 b2 c1 for that matter but then you would have to have you would have to put in extra efforts to also learn the subject specific vocabulary which is also I mean I if I were at a position wherein I had to go take a German taught course I would do that uh but then it is it also then depends on how much time are you ready to invest in 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 a particular program or in the particular field so that again aligns with whatever it is that you had planned for the future but otherwise german if you want to st if you want to take up a german course it is difficult in case you do not have a good knowledge of german the second question is how easy or difficult is it to cope up with with the language in germany i don't know if i understand the question correctly um anushri uh, if you can explain what you're looking for i'm just asking like um say if we go with a level a1 knowledge or um, a level a2 of knowledge so i'm see the a1 level or an a2 would be a basic shoe for the it's 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 beginners right and then you go on to b1 and b2 which is intermediary yeah. and then you would go on to uh, the native language proficiency which would, which would be c1 and c2 so if yeah. you're looking to do a course in Germ in germany at a german university in german i yeah. would recommend that you have at least c1 to first of all understand whatever is going on and then you also would be working on the fuck specific the 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 subject related vocabulary but also it is extremely important that you get in touch with the german university and okay. see what uh, what level of language would they need you to have as in because sometimes anushri it is not just the certificates it is not that you have a certificate of c1 
it is not that you could you can uh, you have so c1 or c2 or b1 it is how well can you comprehend how well can you understand how well can you read how well can you write it yes. right so sometimes you could we, we could just write the exam take the exam pass it but it again depends on the understanding of 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 the yeah, language so so like i mean because i'm guessing the majority of the people there would be speaking in german so uh from an outsider like india where we've no had no experience past experience of being to the place how difficult or like does it take to adjust to the general life i'm not talking about like a german taught course in specific but uh-huh. like, like a usual routine sort of a thing to manage things in there I would say one has to be open. Yes, Ankit, I was about to actually give it yeah. to you, but then oh, I right. personally would uh, say that one has to just be open about things because it completely depends on uh, how, what are the situations and how how you are, how open you are as a person. For yes. me, Germany has not been a problem, uh, also because I knew the language. But I would now hand it over to Ankit to actually be answering okay. the question. So, uh, yeah, um, I I can relate more to her because I went there with an A one. uh i think uh, to simply put it uh, i would say in day to day life if you're going to a city like frankfurt munich hamburg a larger city uh, which is like an eco- economic paradise for a lot of industries uh, yes. knowing english and a basic amount of german would get you along of course you know when you get into a situation with a ticket checker or at a supermarket who uh, is very adamant about uh, you speaking in german you might have some situations but again as i said life skills so that could happen to us anywhere even in india right uh, so in terms of daily life uh, it's absolutely okay uh, and if you go to a smaller town like people go to wismar for lighting design uh, this the city will teach you german you know they will teach you so they will make sure that you end up learning and uh, they will uh, of course this won't be like your test staff or a goethe certificate but you will know what are the words you need to know and what are the lines that you need to know and it would be something you will pick up on uh, coming to the first question or which someone else had asked about taking up a course in german if german has not been almost native to you like english has been to most of us i would yes. highly as as an industry person i would highly recommend you not to do it uh, because yes. also remember like kanji said it's not just about the certificate but it's also an emotional understanding and and our discussions are very intimate right with your professor yes. with your different colleagues so if you can't understand the intimacy of that conversation on what he's trying to articulate to you it's going to be extremely difficult for you to uh, be there with the professor or with the faculty and to understand yes, and experience yeah. it yeah. yeah so if you have c2 uh, and you've been to germany many times and you interact with germans already then maybe it's fine but otherwise i would not recommend you to do it yeah. and uh, another question is that i've heard that like germans are like very specific about things so are there certain things that we keep in mind while designing our application portfolios um okay so again this will differ from where you apply to where i went uh, at the stadel schule i had only one german in my class one more or two more germans in the senior class and one german professor so okay. it was absolutely uh it was absolutely a different experience in terms of application in terms of everything that we did there uh but yeah. if you go to uh, tu berlin or if you go to tu munchen uh, where it's a little more regulated by the university uh then of course uh, you have to always make sure that you uh at least uh, if nothing else follow all that is there in the application requirements so uh, portfolio requirements if they say 20 uh, pages of a4 size um just do 20 pages of a4 size if you want to do anything else then you need to ask them and as kanchi mentioned before typically you should not expect them to reply within 2 days any german would take 2 to 3 weeks to even reply to one single question because in german all is in order no all is in order so whether you have 50 questions or whether you have one question your priority is only going to be on first come first serve basis unless there is a huge situation Yes. So yeah, but we can you can connect with me and we can talk more about portfolio and all that. Sure, sure. And Thanks, uh, just a small last question. Um, so I saw on the dad website as well as the some of the university websites like TU Berlin. So they mentioned okay. something known as restricted admission for certain courses. So, okay. uh, what exactly does the term restricted admission mean? So do they have like intake? Were you using Google Translate on your desktop while? Uh, no. 
No, I think it was. Uh, I think yeah. okay, the question is about the numerous clauses. Okay. The okay. NC. Then you, so, you won't be able to answer this. <laughs> so it's nothing. It's just that there are specific seats. I mean, usually, uh, I mean, for the German universities, they would some courses would have very specific number of intake, and that is what it means. So. Uh, hmm. Then it is extremely competitive in that sense because uh, they're specific. They're this number of seats. They wouldn't admit any more students, hmm. and thus the competition. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Sure. Thanks, Pleasure. Anushree. Thanks, Anushree. Uh, in the interest of time, I think we'd like to proceed, and uh, uh, I would really like to thank both of you, uh, Miss Arora and Mr. Savla, for. Uh, sparing your time and coming here and making the students aware of the whole process and uh, the experience that a student also undergoes in this uh, course. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, ma'am. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank, thank you so much for you. having us here. Thank you. Thank you. OK, coming to the um, next session, we are joined here by Professor Ralph Niebergal, from Dessau International Architecture Graduate School, Anhalt, Germany. Kindly allow me to introduce the university and Professor Ralph. Hello, Professor Ralph. Hello. Thank you for having me. It's our pleasure, sir. Give me, please give me two minutes to introduce you. The DIA is a branch of the Department of Architecture. Facility Management and Geo-Information, which is part of the Anhalt University of Applied Science. The campus is located in Dessau in direct proximity to the Bauhaus building by Walter Gropius. The campus boasts of a modern up-to-date facility, including seminar and lecture rooms, as well as printing, wood, metal, sculpture, 3D printings, and robotic workshops. The Dessau International Architecture, Architecture Graduate School, or DIA, starts, uh, started its two-year master program in 1999. It was established in response to the Bol Bolo, uh, Bologna process. The full-time course offers 120 credits. It finishes with an internationally recognized Master's of Arts degree and is accredited by the ASIIN. The language of in instruction is English. Today, DIA is the largest English-taught master program in architecture in Germany. Currently, about 100 students are enrolled per year. Over the past 20 years, more than 1,500 students from, all over from over 50 countries have graduated from the program. Talking a little about Professor Nebelgal, uh, uh, he studied architecture at the Bauhaus University, Weimar. After his studies, he worked in major architecture and urban planning offices in Berlin and Halle, as well as Magdeburg. Since 1990, he has headed his own offices in Halle and Magdeburg. Berg, sorry. He was appointed as professor in 1995 for design and building studies in Magdeburg, where he was dean between 2002 and 2005. Since 2006, he has been a professor in Dessau and is the director of DIA since 2019. He is the vice president of the Federal Chamber of German Architects for International Affairs. A very warm welcome to you, Professor. My apologies for any mispronunciation that I made. And uh, <laughs> you may now address the participants, sir. Thank you very much for this uh, nice inter interpretation. <laughs> you did it quite well, even these difficult <laughs> German <you>. <laughs> names of cities. And we thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, allow me to start to underline what you said already. You said already nearly everything <laughs> about us. Uh, with a short video, I hope I can manage it. Okay. Oops. Unfortunately, I'm sorry. <laughs> 
the system doesn't allow it. Uh, so, so you want me to share the uh, presentation with uh, from my end because I I think I have it in my drive. I can't share my screen. Yeah. yeah, here's Sandra. I have the same issue. It's asking for permission, but it's not allowing me to give permission. So it would be very nice if you would be able to share um, the video first. Okay. okay. And um, yes, the PDF yes. after. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Just give me one minute, please. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. The music was a little bit horrible. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Uh, I think but, it's uh, no problem. <laughs> but the PDF is without sound. Can you start it? Yes, uh, I'll try to share the PDF as well. Thank you. <clears throat> as you see here, the course has a very long name, Dessau International Architecture Graduate School, and therefore we just call it DIA usually. Can you go to the next slide, please? Problem loading the pages.
please give me one minute. I'll try downloading and resharing it. Okay. Perhaps I can talk a little bit. Uh, yes, sure. <laughs> in between, <laughs> in between uh, Sandra Giegler was already to hear. She's joining me because she's uh, one of the scientific coordinators of our of our program. And <clears throat> as you already said, in the moment we are the largest English taught master course. Uh, in Germany with about 200 uh, students in the moment, 100 in the first year and, two, uh, and 100 in the uh, second year. So I heard you uh, talking about the necessity to uh, be capable of the, of the German language uh, concerning the teaching, it is not necessary in our course uh, to be familiar with with German but of course we recommend uh, to use the opportunity at the university to learn German in uh, parallel because for the everyday life uh, as already had been seen going shopping seeing a doctor <laughs> having some issues with Germans administrations it's recommendable to uh, learn German and of course um, if you want to do for instance which is always recommendable um, some internships in, in, in German offices then it is the case that larger offices speak English in their everyday uh, life but to understand for instance um, very difficult German uh, building codes. <laughs> it is <laughs> recommendable uh, to to speak to speak German. Um, to talk about a little bit about about our um, our course, we have a quite good mixture of um, regular staff from uh, the universities, us as professors who. Uh, are teaching there and uh, people who come as guest lecturers or uh, guest professors um, from offices and teach uh, at our university uh, and we marry very much like this um, exchange of let's say the university sphere <clears throat> and the sphere of um, the professional practice because it's uh, always good for for the students to, to learn also uh, from these guys who are working internationally uh, for instance but also most of our professors at the at the universities have their own uh, offices and so they are experienced in this so this what you see here in, in blue is our small main building pretty much in the back, it's nearly not visible, is um, the dorm of the famous Bauhaus building from 1926. Uh, you see a very transparent uh, main building where the, most of the courses uh, take place. We sometimes call it the aquarium because the professor's offices uh, are really transparent. Can you go to the next slide, please? Now it obviously works. Um, now Sandra Gigler presents. Wow. Sandra? Unfortunately, I can, can't see the presentation anymore. Uh, Ms. Sandra, are you presenting? Uh, I unmuted. Hello?
Miss Sandra, you're on mute if you're if you're talking something. I haven't. I wasn't talking, but I okay. was trying to share. Yeah, I we can see it now. Yeah. Funny enough, mm -hmm. I can't. So um, <laughs> that's a, a Zoom is just so much easier than Google Meet. I'm sorry about that. Right. Um, <laughs> if you can see what I'm sharing, maybe you can tell me what I what you currently see, so I can forward to where we are. We do so. We do see the booklet and the first page. Okay. But the first okay, so picture only. <laughs> can you very good. Go so I can move on to the second now. Have you been there already? <laughs> yes. So maybe we have, you talk and we good, have and been, I, we I, have I been there already. Good. Is that a good spot? We don't see anything. Yeah, right now it's a black screen. Oh my goodness, it must be an internet connection issue because I can see now the third page talking about DIA. And I am... Uh, do you want us to share it back uh, from our end? If you are able to, I think that seems to be working much better than from my end. Yeah, yeah, we will reach it. I am... Yeah, I'll do that. Uh, you just need to stop presenting then so that yes. I can start. I will stop that now. <sighs> It seems so easy. Google Meet promises to be so simple. And even when you start uh, joining, you have to decide whether you're just participating or you're presenting. That is already where the first obstacle, I think, is presented. <laughs> <laughs> yes. OK, <clears throat> then we can already go to the next slide. To save some time. <laughs> okay, this you mentioned already <clears throat> that the master program started 26 years ago with 100 students enrolled per per year, and uh, so we can go to the next slide already. Yeah, this is of course the highlight. Uh, this is the famous stage of the Bauhaus building and the graduation ceremony after two years of studies for all our students from all over the world, from South America to India. In the moment, I think we have per year about 20 Indian students. Next slide, slide please. Um, <clears throat> um, the atmosphere here in this small town, Dessau has about 80,000 uh, inhabitants. It's very, it's very special because we are uh, not a mass university. Uh, we are a quite small family uh, and the students from our course come across every day. And therefore I really call the dear very often the dear family. And um, the teaching is, at least in the studios, in, in very small groups. You see here that the students can choose from about eight to 10 different studio projects, a wide variety of studio projects. And this results in small groups of about 10 to 14 uh, studios. And the studios are accompanied by a variety of elective and compulsory classes. I will talk about this in the next slide, I guess. Just briefly the program layout. Next slide, please. As I said, the studios are anyhow the core of, of teaching and direct exchange with the teacher. Um, and these are accompanied by a wide variety of electives ranging from architectural issues, artistic issues uh, to social or so, to social is, issues. And parallel to that, we have uh, CAD logic because one can say we have perhaps uh, two core areas of teaching. Uh, one is advanced technologies, in 3D modeling uh, 
for instance, and the other one is architecture in urban in urban context. And for this is, of course, a good knowledge in architectural history and in urbanism um, necessary. And always, this is always after every se semester and big event uh, to have public final presentations. Next slide, please. And the second year, starting in the, in the third semester, already deals uh, with the preparation uh, for the thesis, and it ends up um, in the fourth semester with the master thesis, um, with two advisors, usually. Next slide, please. About the staff, I talked already, so we can skip this next slide, I can say. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Administration, as I said, I'm the director in the moment, moment and uh, the course is led by the DIA board, consisting of teachers and one student representative. And Sandra, as one of the coordinators, uh, is here and the students are also assisted uh, by student assistants, especially those in the first semester um, by students from the higher semester. Next slide, please. Application and finances might be of interest, uh, of interest for you. Uh, the enrollment, uh, the take-in is uh, each winter semester starting on October 1st and the application process, as you see here, is currently running. It runs from December 15th to April uh, 15th. And the requirements are, of course, a diploma on bachelor in architecture, um, an English test, which shouldn't be a problem <laughs> for you. But the most important thing is the selection process. Uh, by a so-called selection committee consisting of uh, at least two teachers. One of them, it's, it's me. And we review your portfolios. Um, there are three university or practical pro, uh, uh, projects required uh, to present them on what we are uh, focusing on is to see the creativity of uh, the students. It's not that much about slick visualizations and, and these think, things for us. It is important to have an innovative and uh, creative approach to certain uh, tasks. And then we have a variety of uh, necessary documents like passport and this language test certificate and the diploma and these things but the core is really uh, the select core for the selection is really the quality uh, of the portfolio next slide please finances the fees are fairly low 850 euros per uh, semester plus 86 euros for some administrative things for the students card and these things um, the DAAD offers, uh, especially for the second year, some um, scholarships, but these are limited. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> some of our facilities, you have seen them already in the video. Um, this is, for instance, the library, uh, a building from the 1960s. We, share with the Bauhaus, uh, which is seen in the back. Next slide, please. Printer, printing workshop, laser cutting for modeling. Next slide, please. A variety of workshops here wood workshops that makes it possible to build one-to-one mock-ups and uh, models 
metal workshops. We have two. Next slide, please. Print shop, of course. Next slide, please. Spaces for exhibitions, for instance, here uh, from professors that teach sculpting. Next slide, please. The atmosphere is really a work and workshop atmosphere at our university. And the next slide, please. And because digitalization, digitization is a big issue, um, we have also a robot workshop where uh, and 3D printers uh, to make big models and mockups. So, yeah, here you see it. <laughs> it is the most expensive thing we have in, uh, in the moment. And next slide, please. It's not only about learning and teaching, but of course, well-being, uh, a big cafeteria. And the next slide, please. Smaller cafeteria. Next slide, please. And to work out after the work, also a gym. That's it. Last slide, if you are interested, I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Sorry for these technical issues we had, but I hope it was not too boring. No, no, it was very interesting, Professor, I must agree. And uh, I, uh, students, if you have uh, participants, if any questions you have, can you please post it on the chat box? Uh, in the meanwhile, sir, I have sir, some questions which we had collected before. Um, can I read them out to you? Yes, please. Okay, one, uh, one of the students has asked, uh, the SOPs that they write for applying at your school. So what uh, is the intent of the SOP? What does it revolve ar around? Like, what do you look for the students into the in the students? Sorry, what do you mean with SOP? Sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. Statement <laughs> of purpose, the statement of purpose, which they give when they when they're applying for your university, you know. Uh, do they have that process? What uh, what are the requirements that like do you see the portfolio of the students who have applied, or is it like a write up or what? Andra, can you answer this question? Saying if you want me to to jump in, um, a motivation letter or letter of motivation or the SAP as you call it. Is not a not a mandatory thing, but it's always appreciated to understand why the students are interested in a master education and why they are especially interested in a master education in the environment that we are offering. So oh. we re we receive uh, the portfolio, we receive the CV, we look at all the documents that the students upload, and we look at the complete picture of that application material. So it's not just a one point thing that we're looking at. We're looking at the complete picture of what the students is representing to us and what we can represent to them. So it's not a simple question of you have to be uh, six feet tall and weigh 50 pounds. That's not it. Yes. <laughs> it's a very complex <laughs> package that we are we're, we're looking at. And the portfolio, as you all know, the portfolio speaks the most of what it is that you are as an architect and what it is that you aspire to be as a future architect. Yes. So it's not a simple question. It's not a simple answer. <laughs> OK. <Yeah. laughs> OK, uh, Professor, a uh, few of them want to know about the future job prospects after uh, like finishing their graduation. What are the options that they might have? Despite the pandemic in, in Germany, the building industry is in the moment quite strong. Of course, the future prospects we all 
the, don't know and, and therefore the opportunities to get a job in, in, in Germany are quite good. But as I said earlier, then it is very much recommendable to uh, learn German during uh, the studies. Uh, we can say about 20% of our students stay in, in Germany at least about two years after their uh, studies, but most of them, of course, go back in, to their home countries or to other countries within uh, Europe. Our course is Europe-wide uh, recognized, so it is. There are procedures of uh, <clears throat> acknowledgments, uh, but it's quite easy to work everywhere in, in, in Europe. Okay. Thank you. Um, there is one message from uh, one of our participants, Shristi. She has written, thank you, Professor. The program at Dessau is the one that I'm looking forward to be a part of. Would it be possible to correspond further with you post this regarding the program? Yes, of course. <laughs> we are always approachable for questions. That's but of course, the, the, of, the official uh, application process uh, runs via uh, uniassist, www.uniassist.de, I think, um, where you must upload all your, all your uh, documents um, and are also guided a little bit uh, through this application uh, process, but for Further questions, uh, Sandra, for instance, and me are always approachable. And one important thing, considering what the gentleman of the DAAD said, we do not take two to three weeks to answer an email. I don't know what experiences <laughs> he has made. Um, that's not standard German, and it's definitely not standard DIA. So uh, consider your email read and answered in due time, not within two or three weeks. I cannot hear you. Can anybody? Uh, Alicia, you're not audible. Yes. Uh, now is it audible? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. sorry. Yeah. Uh, one last question I have. Um, is it possible to continue the research in the form of a PhD at the same institute at DIA? Like if at master's level somebody is doing a research? Unfortunately, not only at the DIA, because we uh, are a university of applied sciences, um, but we uh, cooperate with other uh, universities, uh, like for instance, the Humboldt University uh, in Berlin, and therefore it is uh, possible to run a PhD program on, on both institutions. And finally, you get your PhD certificate, um, for instance, at the Humboldt University, but accompanied by our uh, school. Okay. okay. Am I right, Sandra? Yes, and if I may add to that, just of yesterday, um, the school is currently applying to receive permission to also conduct a PhD program, even though that we have this level of of applied sciences, but there has been a new law um, just passed and just enacted, and the university is on a good track to get permission to also offer PhDs at our site. But that's not finished yet. We're still in process. Okay. Uh, professor, I do have a question. My name is Helen May, I'm also coordinating this uh, session. Um, could you just explain a little bit to our students about practicing in architecture uh, in uh, Germany and uh, how is it, is it more of private firms uh, that handle architecture or there's a lot of public, because there, uh, there's public housing, social housing on uh, all of these. So could you just throw some light on practicing architecture? The majority of practicing of architecture is in private uh, firms. Uh, 
some municipalities or even lender have their own, let's say, design departments, uh, but only for their for their own projects. Uh, for instance, if they need a new civil hall, from time to time they plan it <clears throat> uh, on their own. But um, this is perhaps only two percent of uh, of the market. Um, all the other tasks in architecture are done by private firms. Um, the structure of uh, in Germany or Europe-wide, with the exception perhaps in, in, in the United Kingdom, is that the uh, offices are quite small. Uh, so most of them between five to ten uh, people, which uh, allows a high flexibility, and we have only about 10% of offices have more uh, than, than 100 employees. Um, some are specialized, for instance, on hospital buildings, uh, which is an uh, intensive functional issue, but, uh, but most of the, of the companies do really everything uh, from, as you said, uh, social housing to uh, museums and uh, competitions are an issue and you have also the chance as a smaller office uh, to win competitions um, at least in building topics uh, of a limited uh, size. And what is perhaps uh, special in, in Germany, what is uh, what is not everywhere the case is um, that most of the offices really deal with the um, whole complex or the whole scope of uh, planning and building. They start with preliminary designs, um, but supervise, at least in the office, these are not always the same persons in the office, also the building sites. There's still a strong connection between uh, the planning and the building process in, uh, in, in, in Germany. And this is perhaps something what is not everywhere the case. And uh, do you procure, you need to procure or register as an architect to practice architecture? Or um, how uh, does the state or the government suggest any licensing for this? Yeah. Okay. As it was said already, I'm the, I'm the vice president of the Federal uh, Chamber of German Architects, but this is only an umbrella organization. Um, we have chambers in each of the federal states, the lender in Germany, <clears throat> and um, they are entitled to register uh, the architects um, after their studies plus two years of practical uh, practice and then you apply uh, for the registration in the chamber and then you are entitled uh, as architect. Right. Thank you, Professor. And of course, you have then uh, the opportunity to hand in uh, building permission uh, documents, for instance reserved to architects and engineers from a certain scale of, of buildings. Right. Right. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. Uh, this is it from our side in terms of the questions that we had, Professor. Uh, we would like to thank you again for taking the time out from your busy schedule to be a part of our program and help our uh, graduates and students to understand the possibilities of uh, studies in germany so i really thank you on behalf of team of the team of rv college of architecture sir it was a pleasure thank you thank you sir and i also would like to thank miss sandra for arranging the whole session for us for uh, uh, helping us connect to Professor in such a smooth manner. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We're looking forward to your students applying.
Sure, Thank sure. We, we hope so. <laughs> and we're Thank currently you. open, so there's no necessity to wait. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I hope they're getting that. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Uh, it was nice meeting both of you, and we'll keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Okay, as we move to the last uh, session of this, uh, towards the last session of this webinar, we um, would like request you, we'll put a small feedback form link in the chat box. We would request you to fill that out for us so that um, we get an idea of what uh, was what was ben you benefited from and what you could we could have done better for the next programs so kindly take two minutes out of your schedule and fill the uh, feedback form this is for all the participants um, now we move to the end of this webinar with the final alumni session uh, we are joined here by architect Subin Jamil, who is an R RV alumnus. Uh, are you there, Subin? Hey, yes, I'm here. Hi. Uh, let me Hi. introduce you in two minutes. Um, Subin okay. Jamil is an architect and a graphic designer with interests in practice, pedagogy, speculative research, and theory. After receiving a bachelor's degree in architecture from, architecture from RVCA in 2013, he worked as an architectural designer at the Architecture Paradigm Bangalore for three years. He also freelances as a graphic designer and has produced branding solutions for both web and print media. His practical experience and design inquisitiveness led him to pursue a Master's of Arts in Architecture at the Stadel in Frankfurt, Germany, followed by the Master's of Science in Architecture, Theory and Pedagogy at Sci Arc, Los Angeles. In 2020, he worked as a full-time assistant teacher at Sci Arc, Los Angeles for three semesters. He is currently a studio tutor at SEPT Ahmedabad for their undergraduate program at the Faculty of Design. Uh, Architect Subin, we welcome you and the platform is all yours. We would like you to uh, take it over by talking about your journey and your experiences. Yeah, so hey guys, I think most of what you already said about me is the journey so far, but uh, I'd like to maybe, and we've already sort of covered a lot of the topics and questions which students have been asking with, with uh, some of the other presenters so far. So maybe I'll talk a little bit about stuff we haven't spoken so far. Uh, well, to be honest, after I graduated from RB, you know, uh, like Matt said, I worked in architecture paradigm in Portugal for three years. And for me, it was very important uh, to be sure of the path I was sort of taking before I did a master's. You know, before I was convinced that okay, this is something that I'd like to do, a specific area that, I, that I'd like to pursue. And my whole journey in architecture has been a, a rather unconventional one, you can say. So I spent three years in architecture. I think I reached a point within the practice where I figured that, okay, now I know how to uh, tackle a design problem that is given to me and how do I take it to site and how do I talk to the vendors and the consultants and the clients and I sort of thought I learned everything that I had to learn from the firm, which took me around three years. You know, and after that, it was important for me not to just go to another firm and then sort of repeat the whole process or start doing it myself because I had a feeling I was confident enough to do it anyway. So I sort of was looking for a challenge where I could maybe unlearn a few things because even when you're going for your master's I think it's very important for all of you to realize that you're not going to do a master's to necessarily continue working the same way you're working or think about design problems the same way you think about approaching a design problem there's a lot of you know unlearning stuff that you have learned before these uh, comfort zones that you get very uh, eased into uh, so whenever you do go for a master's i think at least for me personally it's been helpful to go through a period of practical experience where i can pinpoint my own pinpoint my own interests 
So it makes it easier for me to pick a master's because nowadays you have a, a hundred options to really choose from. And there's a specialization for everything. So I think practical experience beforehand helps if you're a little unsure. And you know, once that sort of began, I it's funny enough that I uh, saw Ankit uh, Sabla here today because both of us went to the same school. We graduated in 2015 and I joined in 2016. And uh, I was sort of looking at an institute which I wasn't looking for a technical education institute like a, a Berlin or a Munich. I was looking for a course which was somewhat related to an art practice. And the state of Pune sort of offered me that it was in an art campus. The school is essentially known for it's one of the uh, more prominent art schools in Germany. In fact, it's, it is the most famous one in Germany and very well known around Europe as well. So this is an architecture school sort of associated with it. So it's important for me that I surround myself with people who are not just involved in architecture, but, uh, you know, look at design from a larger perspective and make the right fit for me. And it also helped that I knew a few people who had already been there. I knew the kind of work which has happened there over the last couple of years. And I suggest that we do your research also before, before going in, try to find portfolios online uh, because you are making portfolios at the moment. Try to see the kind of work that's being done in the school. Go look at their websites. Try to find students who are already studying there, ask them questions, send them mails. You'll be surprised, people really do get back to you. Um, so that's the whole reason why I went to Germany, because it wasn't so, uh, it was more speculative, it was more conceptual, and it, it sort of the school was more like an art practice combined with uh, architectural education. And that was two years, and once I went there, it really changed my whole idea of how I looked at architecture, how I approach architecture. And, um, from there onwards, I was invited to study in the school in Los Angeles for a program just specific to do with teaching architecture. Uh, so I went there for a year. I didn't stay back in Germany to work. As soon as my course was over, within a month, I was out to LA and I joined the new school. And that was an, another completely different experience because I didn't design much at that school. It was a lot of uh, designing syllabi and uh, sort of uh, mentoring the studios in the school and a lot of op observation on how things was done at an academic level and writing a lot of papers and things like that. And that was a one-year course which I did. And after that, I ended up teaching there uh, for a while and sort of working very close with the faculty there in sort of crafting a studio and figuring out what tools to introduce and how to go about uh, you know structuring the course and i sort of did that for around three semesters and now i'm trying to use a lot of that or whatever i've learned and i run my own studio now except i just started there last month and uh, it's been sort of an unconventional switch for me, because most people would want to go uh, do their masters and perhaps work in a large company. I sort of chose the other route where I sort of went in, you know, uh, in academia itself. Uh, so right now, I sort of have one foot in academia and one foot in practice, but more in academia at the moment. And that's been my journey so far. And uh, yeah, I, I'm really open to see if you guys have some questions for me. Participants, you can uh, put in the chat box if you have any questions. In the meal, meanwhile, I'll put up the ones that I have in hand with me. Uh, okay, uh, because you have uh, undergone masters in two different continents so, uh, as such, and I'm sure the whole course structure and the pedagogy must have been different or similar. I, we don't know. We want to know from you. Like, um, wh how? What is your uh, take on that? doing a master's in US and doing a master's in Germany. Yeah, and to be very honest, the school in the US is like a typical school in the US uh, that I've done uh, my degree from. It's like any other typical architecture school. But the school in Germany that I've gone for is not like any other architecture school in Germany. It's really a one of a kind. 
it's essentially like a small family. We only have 60 students uh, in the whole program. Mm -hmm. So we in while we are in a big university, our school is literally inside university, the, almost it seems like a small house. All of us are in the house together. The one with even Ankit and me went to. It's called the stable cooler. And it was very intimate. Uh, it was certainly more diverse in terms of the kind of people who you will see in most German schools. You'll find very less Germans actually. You'll find that there are people from all over the world, from, from Asia, from Russia, from the US, from different countries in Europe, uh, from the Middle East. So if you really want a diverse sort of a um, world view of how architecture is even from other countries and what expertise people bring, I think Europe's a really good uh, fit for that. If you're if you're looking for that sort of lifestyle, and Europe is also much more relaxed. Uh, schools there are also a lot more relaxed. Uh, most schools will really let you be and sort of take things at your own pace uh, until you figure out what your design interests are and you know which specialization you would like to pursue further. And unlike in India, we're very we're very used to. And I say this because you know I've been to Harvey as well, so we have this whole thing. We're very used to uh, having teachers spoon feed all those things to us or to tell you to do things a certain way uh, when confused. Because when you start off a class, everything's already structured for you. This is the kind of drawings you have to do. This is your site. This is the typology. Um, so a lot of these things are structured for you. I think what very few people realize is when you're going to do a master's. It's really a sort of open world where the rules are very loose, right? So it's always best that you come to a master's course already sort of having some interests. So that's why I feel personally it's important to work for a while, to develop some interests, at least find out this need that you like to explore more. So you come with some sort of an interest to sort of further explore when you do a master's. Not like you can't do it without it, but it, it certainly helps to give you some direction. So Europe, in that sense, it really allows you to be free. And uh, most schools are like that. They really allow you to spend your time and take your time with uh, how they educate the structure. The US, on the other hand, feels like a school almost. It's almost like you're going back to school where you have classes every day, you have periods, you have homework every day, and it's very rigorous, it's incredibly competitive, uh, which also, it depends. Uh, for somebody, you might like the American system way of working a little bit more because they, you might feel like your best work only comes out in an environment where you see everybody working and you know, everybody's working hard and you would also, which, Definitely want to match that energy and uh, produce and uh, get to your work faster. But that's sort of the difference I feel. In America, is very competitive. Europe is very laid back in that sense. Um, even with their work timings, you know, it's if it's from nine nine in the morning to five p.m., it's still five p.m. You don't have to stay back in the office afterwards. They don't even like the fact that you stay back in the office longer. In the U.S., I think it's not so much. Uh, so that's the main difference, you know, it, it's sort of a, that's just how the lifestyle is there. Uh, this is what pops out um, most to me in the list, the difference between how the U.S. and Europe works as well. Okay. Uh, yes. Thank you. Actually, it was a very elaborate description, which answered most of my other questions. Uh, I just, if I may ask, uh, just one uh, last point I wanted to ask, like, uh, after doing your master's earlier, like your initial idea was also to come back to India or you wanted to work there? Like, how did you plan out your uh, career prospect beyond that? Right. Well, you know, sometimes things don't necessarily work out exactly like you plan. Uh, especially in this day and age, you know, really anything can happen. I think you really have to go with the ment mentality of being adaptable to what situation uh, is thrown to you. I mean, for me, after I left Bangalore, I thought, okay, I'll do a master's in Germany and I'll work there in an office. That was it. 
and uh, as soon as I did my masters, and then this opportunity of I got invited to you know join another university and uh, got a scholarship for it. So it was great, and I, I'm, it's only one more year. And I, I think after going to uh, the state of Shula in Germany, I I got more interested in uh, theory and other modes of thinking about architecture, with softwares. A lot of that, and it sort of just gradually and organically led to this uh, the other opportunity that I had. And from there on, you know, I started getting uh, more opportunities opportunities to teach, and I sort of just let it let it go in that direction because I was actually having fun and I was learning a lot. Uh, it was intellectually very stimulating, and I could still do all the things that I enjoyed doing in school. You know, experimenting with my modeling skills and making things and all of that. To an extent, even much more than if I had worked in an office. So I didn't want to let go of that. Um, so I continued doing that. But I think the reason I came back now, I did eventually plan on coming back. Uh, but this happened a little sooner than expected because of the pandemic, that I couldn't continue there. And uh, my plan sort of just got fast tracked and limited by one year. Otherwise, I would have stayed there for one more year. But nonetheless, you know, I'm back here and I'm sort of continuing where I left off. Uh, then it's uh, still sort of pursuing the same interests which I've been starting, which I'm glad I did. Thank you so much. Um, I, I actually have one question which has been the talk of this afternoon. Did you learn German? And if you did, how much did you learn? <laughs> yeah, guys, if, just imagine, I mean, most of you are from. Bangalore, right? So think about this. If you go to another town which does not speak Kannada, if you go to work in Gujarat, for example, and if you actually want to do architecture in Gujarat, you need to know the local language. There's no doubt about it. Because it's not just as simple as can I communicate with them? If you want to, if, they, if you want them to respect you, you need to speak their local That's just as simple as it is. But even before I did go to Germany, I did learn A1 so that I could I, I would have something to go by so I could start communicating. I didn't go to an A1 course, uh, but most of the stuff I picked up in Germany, even though I learned A1, it really didn't, it wasn't of much use because like Ankit was saying, you need to have some emotional response to the way people talk to you. It's not just... You know, it's not so wicked for the you just need a book and you can suddenly interact with them enough to communicate with them. But consciously, I'd also picked a course which was in English. So it wasn't in school, I didn't have a problem. And to communicate with the students in the school, the teachers, and even the art part, there was no issue at all. Even when I was out, I didn't really need to use German. But there are two things to this. One, of course, if you want to stay in Germany in the long run, most of you need to learn German. There's really no two ways about this. But if you're very hesitant and you don't want to learn German, which I would suggest you do, there are offices, there are international offices uh, which only do competitive projects. And if there's an English speaking student only who refuses to learn German, your job opportunity opportunities will be limited to you being a member of the competition team in the office who just who don't uh, directly deal with Germans because they just do competition proposals, right? So they just have to make uh, renders and uh, competition proposal boards and then uh, submit it. And I think every office has a team which is just for competition process. And you will probably be stuck there if you refuse to learn German. It's not like it's a bad thing. There are some firms with incredibly uh, great uh, teams which just do competitions. But if you want to keep your options open, certainly German, German will really, really go along. Uh, and it's not just in Germany. If you learn German, you can actually get to work in three, four other countries. Who are right. Yeah. yeah. I see in the chat box that the principal sends you his regards. <laughs> it's nice to see Bhavi sir after so I actually talked to him a few months ago, sort of explaining my situation. And I used to be this very naughty kid in the, in the college 
por não estar no, hoje no Zé. Tá bom, que eu agora tenho que conhecer o Pedro. Muito bom. Ok. Um, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Subin, for supporting this event and for your kind gesture of, of taking out time and being a part of this. We had a delay also, and uh, it's very kind of you to cooperate through it all. So thank you so much. Um, we would now like to conclude this webinar. Okay. Um, as we come to the... Yeah, see you. Bye. As we come to the end of day two, as well as the end of this whole series of webinars, we at RVCA hope that this attempt has been well appreciated by all of you. We humbly request you again to fill the short feedback form that it will help us work for the better in the future. The link for the form has been put up in the chat. Please fill it up before leaving. We once again extend our heartfelt gratitude, gratitude to each and every one of you for making this event a successful one. We had around a participation of about 40 students joining us from all over India. We thank the speakers who joined us from across the globe with the sole aim of helping the students and professionals in making the right choices. Thank you for engaging the participants and answering all their questions and concerns. Holding an on offline event would have been definitely cumbersome for all. So thanks to technology, we could bridge this gap and include conversations with the professors of universities for everyone's benefit. We hope to come back with another similar session sometime soon in the future. We wish you all the very best for your future, uh, for your future feats. I extend my gratitude to our principal, Dr. O.P. Balne, for supporting us, to my team, Professor Hiranmai and Professor Vidya, for putting up a successful show. I also would like to thank Mr. Sanjeev, our, uh, our technical manager, for assisting us with the technical aspects of this program. Uh, please do fill the feedback form before leaving. Uh, have a good day, everyone. Namaste. Thank you, Anushree. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.